Hi guys, welcome to the fourth video of this Go tutorial series. In this video, I'll be discussing control statements. In order to be a successful programmer, it's absolutely imperative that you have a clear understanding of control statements. Control statements are responsible for determining when and where your code will be executed and pretty much determine the entire flow of your program. If you've ever heard of the term cyclomatic complexity, it's talking about the different paths that your code can take with the result of control statements. So let's get started. One of the most basic control statements you can use in programming is an if statement. An if statement evaluates a condition, and if that condition is true, it executes a block of code. Here's a simple example. As always, we start off with our package main and our import statements. And then in our main function, we'll declare variable x and set it equal to 5. We follow that up with our if statement. The if statement is evaluating the condition x is less than 10. If that's true, then we'll print out x is less than 10. After the if statement runs, normal code execution is resumed. So that last line will get printed no matter what. Let's give this a try. As you can see, we printed out x is less than 10. No surprise there. That was a really basic example. Let's see what that looks like with an else statement included. Now this is a really similar example, but when we add an else statement, we're saying that if the if statement is not executed, then we want to execute the code in the else block. Again, after those conditions are evaluated, normal code execution resumes. And we can see here that the code within the else block was successfully run. Also notice that unlike some other languages, Go doesn't place any parentheses around the if condition. This is true for for conditions as well, which we'll get into later. Go also allows you to declare variables within if statements, which is where we start to get into scope. Go has block scoping, which means that a variable declared within a block can only be accessed in that block. In this example, we declare the variable a within the if statement block. That means if you try to access it anywhere outside of that block of code, you'll get an error. First, let's see if this works successfully. We can see that the if statement was successfully run there. Now in this example, we try to access the variable a outside of the if statement where it was declared. And if we run this, you'll see that we get an error. One feature that is unique to Go is that you can actually declare the variable inside of the condition that is being evaluated. In this case, the variable is accessible within the body of the if and else block, but it's still not accessible outside of that if else statement. Here we can see that even though A is declared within the if condition, the else statement block is still able to access it. In addition to the if statement and the else statement, you also have the else if statement, which I know sounds really confusing. The else if statement is used to check a condition when the if condition is not true. Up until now, we've been checking the if condition and then if that's not true, we've been automatically just running the code within the else condition. But in some cases, there may be an additional condition that you want to check and then run some code afterwards. And then if all else fails, then you'll run the else statement. So in this example, we set the variable num equal to nine and then check to see if it's less than zero. So that code will not run. And then we check another condition to see if the value is less than 10. So this is the code that will actually run here. So let's run that. And as we can see, it's the else if statement that's run. So again, this is useful when you have multiple conditions that you want to check. Go also has four statements, which are used for executing a block of code a certain number of times or until something is no longer true. Here's a basic example of a for loop. 
In this example, we're creating a variable i and setting it equal to zero. And we're saying that we want the following code to execute as long as i is less than five. And after each iteration, we add one to i. That's what i++ stands for. Note that there's a semicolon after each statement within the for loop. And we can see that we successfully print out each value of i up to five times. This next example is really kind of a more practical use of a for loop. I create a list or a slice is what it's called in Go, a slice of names. And then I create a for loop that iterates through the names and basically prints them out. So again, we set i equal to zero. And we say that as long as i is less than the length of this list, we want to print out the name uh, that the index is referring to. And so the index is determined by using names followed by i in square brackets. And that refers to the specific index of a name within the list. And after each iteration, again, we add one. This is common among other programming languages as well. If for some reason you needed to exit a for loop before it completes, you can use a break statement. So for example, let's say you were iterating over this list of names to check and see if there was a certain name within the list. But once you find it, there's no need to continue looping over the list. So you might add a break statement to say that once you get to a certain value, I want to break the loop. On the flip side, if you want to skip over a statement in the loop, but not break the loop completely, you can use a continue statement. So in this case, again, we're iterating over the name and we're printing, we're printing each name out. But if the name is equal to Sam, we continue so we don't follow up with the print line statement. We're just moving on to the next iteration of that for loop. And we can see that it only prints out Tom and Joe because when it got to Sam, it hit the continue and just moved on to the next loop. A feature that's found in many other languages is a while statement. The while statement typically executes code until something is no longer true. Instead of using a while, Golang decided to stick with the for statement, which you can use just like a while statement in other languages. In these cases, you can basically imagine that for means as long as. So for here, we say i is equal to zero, and we're saying as long as i is less than five, keep printing out i and then add one to i. So you can probably guess that we'll be printing out every value from zero up to four, but not five because the statement will stop once it gets to five. You're also allowed to exclude the condition after the for keyword. So you could just put for and the loop will continue forever until it hits a break statement. So this is similar to the last one, but we're saying once i is greater than five, break the loop. Lastly, we have the for range statement. And this is good for iterating over a list, a slice, array, or any other collection like a dictionary. Earlier, I talked about iterating over the list of names, but typically you would want to use something like this if that's what you wanted to do. You do this by using the keyword for followed up with two variables. These variables will be set to a new value after each iteration of the loop. The first variable is set to the index that's being evaluated. And the second variable is set to the value of the index that's being evaluated. So we're saying for each index and value in this list of names or the range of names within this list, print out the index and the value. And so when we print this, you'll see that we get the index of each name followed by the name itself. Again, it's important to remember that in each iteration, that K and V value is being set to something new. When you're new to Go, that can sometimes screw you up and that's kind of important to remember. Earlier, I mentioned the else if statement, which can be used when there are more than one condition that needs to be evaluated. If you find yourself needing to evaluate multiple conditions, a switch statement is a more clear and more concise way to handle that. 
The switch statement allows you to declare a condition or expression and then evaluate a number of cases and execute the code under the given case that matches. Cases are evaluated from top to bottom and a default case can be declared if none of the cases match. Let's look at a few examples. In this first example, we're going to compare the cases to the value that is returned by this expression time.now.weekday. This is a function call which returns the current day of the week. At the bottom here we have two cases, each to a specific day, and then we have a default case. Today is actually Tuesday, so I would expect the default case to run. The next example is a little different. Here we define a variable called hour and set it equal to the hour of the current time. It's about one in the morning right now, so I would expect the first case to run. And so you can see we can match cases by comparing directly to a value or by evaluating an expression based off a declared variable. There's actually a lot you can do with switch cases in Go, and they can start to get pretty complex once you learn all of the different ways that you can declare and define cases, which is probably outside of the scope for this video. But one last thing that I will say is that Go is a little bit different than other languages as far as its switch case. Uh, because Go only runs the selected case that matches. Some other languages will run the selected case and then all cases that follow, uh, but Go actually breaks the switch statement after a case succeeds. However, there is a keyword that provides a little bit of additional functionality to the switch statement, and that keyword is the fall through keyword. When you use the fall through keyword, you're basically saying not only do I want the matching case to run, but I want the case that follows that one to run as well. And here we can see that in an example where we are simply matching an integer value with the case. And case two is the one that's going to match, but because we use the fall through keyword, case three, which immediately follows it, will run as well. And we can see the results of that printed out here. That does it for this video on control statements. Please let me know what you guys think about this new format. I'd like to continue it if it provides value. Subscribe if you'd like to receive more programming tutorials. I will see you guys in the next video. Thanks for watching.